Please turn in the back of your Psalter hymnals to page 859. 859, that's Belgic Confession, Article 14, The Creation and Fall of Man. I hope that's the right page. I, yeah, okay. This is Article 14 on the Creation Follow Man. I'm, I'm going to read it. You can follow along. It's a, it's a, it's a lengthy uh, article, uh, but it's full of rich instruction, full of rich biblical truth. We believe that God created man from the dust of the earth and made and formed him in his image and likeness, good, just, and holy able by his own will to conform in all things to the will of God. But when he was in honor, he did not understand it and did not recognize his excellence, but he subjected himself willingly to sin and consequently to death and the curse, lending his ear to the word of the devil. For he transgressed the commandment of life, which he had received, and by his sin he separated himself from God, who was his true life, having corrupted his entire nature. So he made himself guilty and subject to physical and spiritual death, having become wicked, perverse, and corrupt in all his ways. He lost all his excellent gifts, which he had received from God, and he retained none of them except for small traces, which are enough to make him inexcusable. Moreover, all the light in us is turned to darkness, as the scriptures teach us. The light shone in the darkness, and the darkness did not receive it. Here John calls men darkness. Therefore, we reject everything taught to the contrary concerning man's free will. Since man is nothing but the slave of sin, cannot do a thing unless it's given him from heaven. For who can boast of being able to do anything good by himself, since Christ says, No one can come to me unless my Father who sent me draws him? Who can glory in his own will when he understands that the mind of the flesh is enmity against God? Who can speak of his own knowledge and view the fact that the natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit of God? In short, who can produce a single thought since he knows that we're not able to think a thing about ourselves, by ourselves, but that our ability is from God? And therefore, what the apostle says ought rightly to stand fixed and firm, God works within us both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Where there's no understanding nor will conforming to God's understanding and will apart from Christ's work. As he teaches us when he says, without me, you can do nothing. So we go from creation to fall and to Christ and his grace. The text for today is Genesis chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, please turn and follow along. In Genesis 1, we learn of the creation of the world and the creation of the couple, Adam and Eve, man and woman, vice regents, together over this world to subdue it and reproduce in it. Then in chapter 2, we read of the tree of life and of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is a test. Will man advance in the image of God, being confirmed in righteousness with the prospect of ultimate Sabbath rest? Or will man choose to disobey God, exalt himself, and not be an inheritor of a confirmed righteousness, but a confirmed evil, and the end in death? Which way will it go? Chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, 
But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply, multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. And then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Heavenly Father, we do pray that as we consider the truths of thy word, uh, that we would heartily embrace them and receive them and find our way back, back to you, having been sent out east from the garden and away from the tree of life, for we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Well, in our Sunday school class, uh, we have been considering the topic of what is man. What is man? What kind of a, uh, a breathing, living organism uh, is man? I've spoken about uh, four components that are used to construct a world and life view. Answer of three questions. Number, question number one is what is ultimate reality? Question number two is what is man? Question number three is uh, what is man's problem? What's wrong with him? And question four then is well, what's the answer to man's problem? Uh, those four very simple questions uh, will be answered by whatever worldview you propose. And so when I'm asking the question, what is man? I'm inherently asking a question, what's my world and life view? Who and what am I in this world? Am I just uh, uh, the product of time and chance and the 
uh, sloshing around of chemicals uh, so that uh, voila, uh, here is this breathing organism that now somehow also uh, uh, has a sense of self-consciousness, is able to engage in, in discursive thought and, and, and words and communication one with the other, uh, just a mere product of chance. Uh, without any particular definition, without any particular purpose other than to appear for a few years and then disappear back into the, the dust or the fundamental uh, uh, elements uh, from this world. And in the meantime, just uh, invent my own ideas of who I am, why I'm here, and how I am to conduct myself. Kind of become my own self-determining uh, being. Uh, that's a, a, a prominent world and life view that people have. Uh, we learned about uh, the idea of, of, of the box, uh, the universe that man lives in as this closed system, and there's nothing outside of it. It, it, it rose out of chance uh, and time, and uh, who knows where it's going to go. <laughs> uh, it, you might say the the... The light came on, and uh, just like any other fire that burns, it has its course of uh, warmth, and, warmth and light, and then it goes out. So that very likely uh, all will be eventually frozen over and drifting away. No, we uh, do not want to imbibe in this perspective of ultimate despair on what man is or what his problem is, or uh, how, how he's to resolve it. I mean, certainly from the first view, there's no answer to the fact that all men who come alive or are born in this world will eventually die. Uh, those who appear will eventually disappear, and we put them in the ground, or we shake them over the ocean in a final sentimental saying of goodbye or whatever. But they no longer exist again. What's the answer to that? Is there any answer to that kind of ultimate despair? Uh, it should, uh, uh, it, it's a worldview that, that, that should terrorize us. Uh, and so no wonder that mankind having bought and uh, this bill of goods on this world and life view carry on in the way that they do. But then there's uh, also the secondary question, not only about who man is and what his purpose in life is, 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 is this creature fundamentally good or evil? And what does it mean when we say good and evil? Good and evil are ethical questions that exist within a certain world and life view, as we've been learning in our Sunday school class. Well, standing in complete contrast uh, to this prevalent materialistic uh, man is no, long, no more than a composition of chemicals with consciousness thrown in uh, is what we read in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, that he is created. He is created by God and he is made in the image of the infinite personal creator. He is a personal creator being made to reflect the one who has made him. We read this in Article 14 of the Belgic Confession. We believe that God created man from the dust of the earth, true, and made and formed him in his image and likeness, good, just, and holy, able by his own will to conform in all things to the will the will of God. And so we see that man is created fundamentally with dignity, with value, inherently. He doesn't have to seek it out. He doesn't have to arbitrarily uh, 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 assign it to himself. He doesn't have to uh, mirror back the culture that is around him at some point in history to make a determination whether or not he has value. No, his reference point 
is the infinite personal creator in whose image he has been made. And thus, each and every single human being, though there be billions of them, does not cancel out the value of each and every one before God. And yet, even though man was made with this great dignity, we find he has a problem. We learn in Genesis chapter 2 that as Adam and Eve was placed in the garden, that God entered into a covenant with them. Now, there's a number of different ways to define the word covenant. One very simple way is to sim simply say it is a contract with consequences. It is a contract between persons with consequences. Meredith Klein defined a covenant as a relationship under sanctions. In other words, it's a relationship that has bound people together in such a way that it's going to result in how you handle it in either a, a sanction of blessing or a sanction of cursing. That's a covenant. A contract between persons with consequence. And that's what Adam and, Adam and Eve had here before God. God entered into a covenant with him and said, here's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do not eat of it. And here is uh, the tree of life. And your decision about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, should you obey, you will have co the consequences of being able to partake of the tree of life. Adam would have been confirmed in righteousness. His probationary testing period would have concluded with what? Allegiance to, affection for, and obedience to God. The image of God, in other words, would have undergone a step forward in its richness, depth, and maturation, depending on if he would indeed obey God with regard to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But on the other hand, if he disobeys God with regard to that tree, uh, he would inherit exactly what is threatened in the, in the contract, in the covenant with God, and that is death. Many theologians have identified this covenant as a covenant of works. It's conditioned upon either Adam's obedience or disobedience. Uh, that's the arrangement if he is to find life, if he is to advance in maturity in the image of God, then he is to obey and therefore expect and look forward to God to come through for him. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A juncture. If Adam says before this tree, what God says is good, and what God says is evil, that's how I know, good and evil. And this tree is bringing that point home to me. God says, don't eat of it. It's evil to do what I said not to do. And that's how I know it, by what God says. And the outcome will be an unfortunate, terrible outcome. I will die. And we know biblically Adam would die spiritually, in an alienation from God, in a fruitful, living, pleasurable satisfaction of knowing Him, He would also die physically, as we find the curse leveled, going back to dust. But He also would die eternally, as in the lake of fire, as we read about in the book of Revelation. He wouldn't end in the great Sabbath rest of eternal glory. And so we know how the story goes, and we just read it here in Genesis chapter 3. Rather than knowing good and evil on the basis of what God said, Adam chose to know good and evil on the basis of what he thought would result in his benefit. Of course, he's tempted by the devil. There's an insertion here to, to, to highlight to bring into sharp focus and dramatic decision, what will you do? 
as God has spoken, as God's adversary has spoken, uh, what direction will you take? And Adam and Eve came to know good and evil like God knows good and evil by playing God and being God. That's what, that's what the text says. They become like us, knowing good and evil. Man becomes his own divine reference point for what is right and what is wrong. And with that choice, rather than moving forward in maturation to a confirmed righteousness in the closing out of that probation period, headed toward an eventual Sabbath rest of glory, man sinks downward into his depravity. Man, the covenant creature before his creator, made to have rich communion with him, made to line up under him, has now become, as we see in Genesis 3, guilty and corrupt. In other words, we call this man's change from great dignity to great depravity. The Belgian Confession addresses this. It says, For he transgressed the commandment of life which he had received, and by his sin he separated himself from God. Separation from God, that's spiritual death. Who was his true life, having corrupted his entire nature. So he made himself guilty and subject to physical and spiritual death, having become wicked, perverse, and corrupt in all his ways. So there we see man's depravity. Adam is the, as has been called by theologians, the covenant head, or the federal head. Federal covenant really means the same thing, of the entire human race. But he stood there representing, having as it is within him, uh, you might say, man qua man in Adam. The entire race going in whatever direction their head chooses to go in. In Romans uh, chapter 5, the Apostle Paul reflects back upon this event in Genesis chapter 3 and what had happened. He says that, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, Verse 18. Verse 19, he says, For as the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. And then in verse 12, he says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. You see what Paul is saying. All sinned in Adam, and thus all died in Adam, because all were counted guilty and condemned, constituted sinners in Adam. Now, this often gets in people's craw, where they will say, well, well, I wasn't there. Oh, why am I getting the raw end of this? Uh, I hadn't even been born yet. Uh, Adam got to start in a pristine garden with a good heart. I come into a fallen world with a bad heart. <laughs> Where's the justice and fairness in that? You often heard with regard to this doctrine of uh, of original sin. This doctrine for Adam goes, the, the whole race goes. And the answer is to it, we must understand that God in His covenant arrangement set it up in such a way that we are part and parcel of Adam. And where He goes, we go. There's some bond of solidarity that is there in God's arrangement that we fell in Him. And thus, we are born with Adam's fallen condition.
characteristic as being sons and daughters of Adam. We're born guilty before the Lord, and we are born corrupt in sin, as David says in Psalm 51. In sin, my mother conceived me. We are born culpable, and we are born corrupt. We are born dirty, and we are born naked. We are born with the pollution of sin, and we are born without righteousness and innocency. As Adam and Eve, having taken of that fruit, what came into their minds? A consciousness, a self-awareness of being naked, being not clothed, being not just and righteous before the Lord. Unclothed, you see. Creating this sense of shame before Him. And why? Why did God, when God questioned Adam, well, why do you have this sensation? The answer was, <laughs> they partook. They disobeyed. They broke covenant with God and receiving the consequences of it within their own persons. But not only are we born into this world and carry uh, with us in this world our union with Adam in being both uh, guilty uh, and polluted, both uh, dirty uh, and naked, but we are also born in captivity. We're born in bondage. It's not like, uh, you know, Adam could say, you know, hey, you know, bad decision, let's do a do-over here, and, you know, let's begin again. No. What had happened, had happened. Now the covenant will play itself out accordingly. And we, we'd all like to be able to say that, uh, be able to say somehow, uh, to be able to break the, the control, the domination that sin has in our lives. But it is what we are born with. The Belgic Confession uh, goes on to say here that he lost all his excellent gifts which he received from God and he retained none of them except small traces which are enough to make him inexcusable. inexcusable. You know, he has small traces. He has some consciousness and awareness of right and wrong, but only enough to render him inexcusable. Moreover, all his light is turned into darkness. And therefore, therefore, the Belgic Confession goes on to say, because of this, we reject everything taught to the contrary concerning man's free will. Man is nothing but the slave of sin, cannot do a thing unless it is given him from heaven. You see, the condition that the Belgic Confession paints of fallen man, not only is he uh, guilty and corrupt, but he's in bondage and can't break out. His thoughts are only evil continually. He is an unfortunate servant of Satan. Jesus said of human nature uh, in John chapter 3, verse 19, that light has come into the world, speaking of himself, but men loved darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Fallen man has an inherent love for evil, a love for what is dark, love for rebellion against God. And his deeds confirm his affections. In 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, when Paul instructs Timothy to preach the gospel, he tells Timothy that uh, those to whom he brings the gospel are captives to darkness. Listen to what he says. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. All right, Christian, how am I supposed to re respond to the evil in this world now that I belong to Christ by faith, uh, with kindness, enduring evil, yet correcting his opponents with gentleness? And then he says this, God may perhaps, that is, if he so wills, 
Grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil having been captured by him to do his will. You see the depth of our fallenness. Sin has the upper hand. We can be given choices uh, all day long. Will you keep God's law? Will you obey God's law? Uh, God's law that teaches us to love Him, to seek to glorify the Lord with our lives, seek to line up our thoughts and our behavior with His law. Will, will, will you do it? I can't. Every effort to somehow comply with God's law becomes evident that you're in bondage to dark forces. The darkness of your own depravity and the darkness of the spirit of this world, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3. Well, how can we break this darkness? I can preach the law of God and try to improve human nature all day long. It doesn't seem to change it. It doesn't seem to make, any, make it any better. But Paul even indicates here with, with the proclamation of the gospel, with the proclamation of good news, as Paul calls it, the knowledge of the truth, the message of salvation by faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, for being clothed in righteousness, for being raised from your spiritual tomb and liberated from the dominating power of sin. Paul says you can't even respond to that message. Your fall is so deep, the grip of sin and Satan so strong that your will is in bondage. And the only way out, Paul indicates, is if perhaps God will intervene to grant repentance. See, that's why the Belgic Confession goes on to quote John chapter 6, verse 44. For who can boast of being able to do anything good by himself, since Christ says, no one can come to me unless my Father who has sent me draws him. Praise God. Praise God that though we who are created with great dignity and overcome by great depravity, are the object of God's redemption in Jesus Christ. We see this here even in Genesis chapter 3. The story is not all dark and bleak. Oh, it is dark. It is very dark, but it is not bleak. God comes after Adam, doesn't he? We find he's naked and ashamed and hiding seeking to bury himself amongst the trees. Staying in the shadows. And God comes to him and he asks the question. What is it? What's the question? Adam, where are you? Do you think he was saying, what tree are you hiding behind? Is it? Is it, is it the oak tree, or is it the redwood, or is it, is it one of the fruit trees? No. He's saying, where are you spiritually, ethically, as my image? And so God comes in confrontation of Adam to bring him forward, to bring him back to him for resolution. Now here is the very typical human response to his question. Where are you? I was hiding. Did you eat of the tree? What's the typical human response? It was my fault. Right? The woman. Oh, did, what about that? The snake. <laughs> it's called passing the buck. Starts right here in Genesis chapter 3. It's really at the end of the day, I did it, but it's not my fault. Where are you, really? <laughs> Adam and Eve are confronted 
There are temporal curse sanctions pronounced upon them. And then in chapter 3, verse 15, the proto-evangelium, the very first indication of God coming redemptively to save and do something about the fallenness of our species. I will put enmity between you and the woman, speaking of the devil, and between your offspring, your seed, the devil's seed, and her seed. Two seeds will now crop out. Not one family, two seeds. Two different sorts of people will now proceed out from this point in time. And there will be conflict between them. Because one will be of the seed of Satan, and one will be of the seed of the woman who receives the promise, he, your seed, shall bruise the head of the serpent, and you, serpent, will bruise his heel. That is fulfilled in the cross of Jesus Christ. That promise is fulfilled in the cross of Jesus Christ four times in the Gospel account. Jesus is suspended upon the cross, uh, bleeding from head, hands, and feet, feet suspended over a hill, a hill in the Greek language called cranium. His heel is bruised and bleeding over the cranium, over the head, over the victory that he achieves over the devil in the gospel accounts, all four gospel accounts, as this promise is realized. Only through what Christ has done upon the cross can the devil be routed. Why? Two reasons. And we see those two reasons in verse 22. I'm sorry, verse 21. The Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin, and clothe them. Garments of skin and clothe them. This is God's victory over Satan. This is God's redemption of his fallen image. It's the resolution to the fact that he is dirty and naked. The shed blood of animals anticipating the shed blood of Jesus Christ, which will wash away our sins and deliver us from our guilt. And then he clothed them with animal skins. Innocent animals. Anticipating the innocency and righteousness of Jesus Christ, with which he will clothe us in our nakedness before him. Satan will be crushed in the cross. And in the cross, Jesus will redeem his people and deliver them from captivity. This reality issues in new life. New life. Here's the way back. Here's restoration. Here's the answer to our corruption and our guilt to us being dirty and naked, the cross of Jesus Christ to wash us in his blood and the completion of his righteousness to clothe us before the Father and be restored. Out of this comes new life. New life in Jesus Christ. Restored to love God. Restored to the loyalty to God by the indwelling Spirit of the resurrected Christ that leads us to walk anew as though depraved, yet praise God, dealt with and redeemed in Jesus Christ. Which view of man do you champion this morning? Man is just a uh, a chance composition of chemicals uh, that will temporarily arise and gasp a little and moan and groan a little to only no longer be seen again as he returns to his fundamental elements in the dust, never to be heard from? Or do you hold to this view, the biblical view, 
that man has great dignity being made in God's image, but great depravity. A great depravity that he cannot fix. He cannot wash away his sins. He cannot achieve the requisite righteousness. He cannot raise himself from the dead. But God's rescue plan in Jesus Christ can. Where are you this morning? Where are you? Are you still in Adam? Or have you come to Christ in all your helplessness, in all your guilt, all your bondage, all your filth, to look to Him, to wash you, to clothe you, and enable you to walk anew and eat of Christ, the true tree of life. Let us pray.